welcome to the Speaking of Women's Health podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Holly Thacker, the Executive Director of Speaking of Women's Health, and I am glad to be back in the Sunflower House for a new episode, and we're going to be talking all things Cushing's disease. And my guest for this podcast is a neuroendocrinologist, Dr. Yogi Morin, and she is the medical director of our pituitary center at Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland. And she's got quite a deep education, and her medical education is quite extensive. She went to medical school at the University of West Indies in Trinidad. She did a residency at our Cleveland Clinic, Florida in internal medicine, followed by a fellowship in endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism at Cleveland Clinic, Cleveland. So she's got certifications and training in internal medicine, endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism, but her primary focus is in seeing pituitary patients who have pituitary problems. And she sees patients at the Cleveland Clinic main campus. And I met Dr. Yogi Morin uh, years ago uh, when she was beginning her career as an endocrinologist. She saw patients in our Center for Specialized Women's Health at the Cleveland Clinic. But then as she was moving on uh, to do more specialized care, we've had other endocrinologists like you've heard on this podcast, Dr. Ula Abed, um, who does a lot of PCOS and thyroid disease and uh, infertility associated with uh, uh, PCOS. So today we're going to focus on a pretty rare disease, but it's getting a lot of attention in the news. And that's because of um, a certain well-known comedian, Amy Schumer. So Dr. Yogi Morin, tell us what you've been up to um, since you moved on from our Center for Specialized Women's Health. Yeah, so since departing from the Women's Health Institute, where I had a great time for many years, I went on to work full time at the pituitary clinic, and I've had quite a few significant life changes. During this transition, my family has grown. I think when I left Women's Health, I had one child, and now I have three. Um, I have a daughter who's Congratulations. three, and I have two sons, seven and ten years old. Yeah. Um, additionally, I have assumed the role of medical director of the pituitary center at Cleveland Clinic, which is within the Department of Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Metabolism. And this is a very specialized center. It's a subspecialty multidisciplinary center where we have neuroendocrinologists such as myself, and we collaborate very closely with neurosurgeons, neuro-oncologists, and radiologists to provide highly specialized customized care to patients with these complex pituitary conditions, all in the same location, making it convenient for patients to see us and get all their you know, subspecialty needs met. Pituitary disease is a lot more prevalent in women than in men. So consequently, a substantial majority of my patients are female, and that has enabled me to continue working in this area that remains a passion, even after leaving Women's Health Institute. Um, I love working with women, and now I help women who are dealing with pituitary conditions. And so why are pituitary disorders more common in women? I certainly have uh, several in my, pay, in my practice as well. Yeah, you know, we're not quite certain why it is more common in women, but we definitely have data that shows that it is more common in women. So overall, the annual incidence of Cushing syndrome in individuals under the age of 65 years old in the United States is about 49 cases per million, which is actually a little bit higher than previous estimates that came from European studies. Um, and females are more likely to develop hypercortisolism from pituitary or adrenal tumors than men. So we do know that some studies even state that it's up to you know three to five times more common in women than in men. So overall, while this condition is relatively rare, it does affect both men and women, and it can have a significant impact on health and lead to various comorbidities. And so recently, 
comedian Amy Schumer brought much needed attention to Cushing syndrome Mm -hmm. and um, her openness about her personal diagnosis has shed light on this frequently misunderstood condition. And I guess that was popping up on Google searches and, and you contacted me and uh, said, Hey, I'd love to do a column on speaking of women's health, which anyone who wants to read that column, as well as a lot of other endocrine and hormonal information, it is on our website, speakingofwomenshealth.com. So why don't you start off by telling us about Cushing's syndrome versus Cushing's disease, pituitary, adrenal? Yes, absolutely. I think, you know, when there is a rare disease, it's very hard to get people, you know, interested in learning more about this. So whenever a celebrity, you know, raises awareness and draws people to be asking questions about this, I'm very happy that we're getting the opportunity to, you know, shed some light on this. I think, you know, when this happens, though, I'm often concerned by how much information is spread on social media and through other avenues. And I think it's very important, you know, that we also address this and and give, you know, information and advice, you know, from the experts that actually see Cushing's and high cortisol every day. So Cushing syndrome in itself is a condition that is caused by prolonged exposure to high levels of a hormone that's cortisol. And, you know, a little word about hormones. I think a lot of times when people hear us speak about hormones, we immediately jump to thinking about estrogen and testosterone, which is great. And they are very important hormones. But hormones are simply chemicals, messengers that our body makes and releases into the bloodstream, which I call the information superhighway in our bodies. And it takes messages to different areas of our bodies and tells them what to do. So it's hard to talk about Cushing's without first talking about the hormone cortisol, which is overproduced in Cushing's and causes Cushing's syndrome. And this is a condition that can make you sick and it can even be fatal if if it's left untreated. You know, another interesting thing, which is hard not to mention since we live in Cleveland, is that Sir Harvey Cushing, often called the father of neurosurgery, is actually interred at Lakeview Cemetery. And he did a lot of his work and a lot of um, neurosurgical techniques were pioneered by him that basically, you know, changed the face of treatment for Cushing's disease from a condition that was basically almost 100 percent fatal to a condition where we, you know, we have surgery as an option for it. But let's go back to cortisol. So cortisol is a very important hormone. It is known commonly as a stress hormone, but it's really an amazing multitasker hormone. It plays a crucial role in regulating various physiologic processes. And physiologic processes just refers to some normal processes that take place in the body that are not disease. So this hormone, that this cortisol hormone, it has a significant influence over numerous aspects of this normal human physiology and, de- uh, and development. And very important for us to understand like what it does normally before we get to talking about Cushing's and what it does when there is excess amount of this hormone in the body. So what does it do? So number one, it regulates our body's response to stress. It also helps control how our body uses fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. And basically, it has an influence on your metabolism. It also can suppress inflammation, and it's important to regulate blood pressure and for regulating blood sugar, and also important in the um, helping control our sleep-wake cycle. So this is a good hormone, right? It helps do many great things. And it was made for us to help us respond to stress. So I'll give an example. Back in the olden days, if you were being chased by a lion or a tiger, your cortisol level would kick in, it would go up and kick off a cascade of very important physiologic reactions. So glucose would be released into your bloodstream so your brain and muscles can manage this emergency situation and help you run away and escape from whatever was chasing you. All the other non-essential systems, such as digestion and reproduction, those would temporarily be shut down so that you could use all your energy to escape from this immediate threat. In short, cortisol hormone is a very great survival tool. 
but it was designed to be released during times of stress, and we were never meant to be stressed for a prolonged period of time. In the olden days, you would either be eaten by the lion, and that would be the end, or you would escape, and your cortisol levels would go back to normal. That is so important. Cortisol levels would go back to normal. Now, this is where Cushing's becomes a problem. When you have a tumor that is secreting hormone cortisol continuously, it never it goes back to normal. And having prolonged cortisol levels being elevated in the body is going to cause a variety of symptoms and problems. So Cushing syndrome refers to a condition where there is excess cortisol in the body, whether it comes from a pituitary tumor, an adrenal tumor, or from what we call exogenous causes, taking extra steroids, which is a form of you know, a cortisol, those things can have adverse events on the body. And it's the prolonged exposure to cortisol or to steroids that causes symptoms of Cushing syndrome. That is so interesting that you brought up that Sir Harvey Cushing is buried in our famous nearby Lakeview Cemetery. That's a great place to go to in the spring and see all the daffodils. Now, of course, our signature flower is the sunflower right. because we want to empower women to yes. be strong, be healthy, and be in charge. And I think that um, there's a lot of confusion about what are hormones versus neuropeptides versus neurotransmitters. I think there's a lot of pop culture that's not accurate about adrenal fatigue or, um, quote, hormones causing weight gain when a lot of it, I think, is related to many people's horrible, horrible diet, processed foods, and way too much right. carbohydrates and high insulin resistant states. And I think that it's complicated for physicians to always understand all the complexities with endocrinology and intrachronology inside the cells, the hormone signaling, that it makes this very, very um, difficult uh, for people to understand. Can you talk about some of the signs and symptoms of Cushing syndrome? Yes, absolutely. So Cushing syndrome, which is a high level of excess cortisol in the body, can manifest through a wide range of signs and symptoms. And I'll try to kind of classify them to keep things you know, clear for us. So you can have some general physical changes. And I think this is what usually brings patients running into our office. The things that are obvious that other people, you know, point out to them. And Amy Schumer was very, you know, forthcoming with how she was diagnosed with it was because of comments that she was receiving, you know, from other people. So some of these visible changes are weight gain. And it's very sometimes a specific sort of weight distribution that happens in people who have Cushing's. So there's weight gain around the abdom abdomen and also around the face. So this is sometimes referred to as a moon face where there's a round red face with, the, you know, fat deposition in the cheeks. Also, there can be a fatty hump between the shoulders, which is sometimes referred to as a buffalo hump. Another area that you might see is the supraclavicular area that might have a fat um, de deposition. And this is something that, you know, most of the time we can all feel our collarbones, right? Supra supraclavicular means this area right above the collarbones. So people may notice that, hey, I don't feel my bone and right behind it, I feel, you know, a lumpy area of fat. This is concerning. Maybe I should see a doctor. So you have this sort of central distribution of fat, and then you have thinning of the arms and the legs. Um, so those that change in the body habitus can be very concerning. Another thing that's very visible is stretch marks, you know, things, skin changes. So people with Cushing's, the cortisol causes decreased wound healing. It causes thin, fragile skin that bruises easily. So they'll notice that you have slow healing of cuts, insect bites, infections, even acne, other infections like that, and you'll have stretch marks. These are a very specific type of stretch marks. They're not like the pale stretch marks that you get if you have you go through a pregnancy or you gain weight. After that, those stretch marks, they fade and they heal to a light pink color. 
In Cushing's, those stretch marks remained very wide, bright red or purple because the skin broke, the skin broke and it did not heal. So you have this very wide, usually more than one centimeter wide st um, stretch mark that remains red or purple. And that's how you can tell that this is a different kind of stretch, um, stretch mark. Then you have musculoskeletal issues. So sometimes this is manifested as muscle weakness, particularly in what doctors call the proximal muscles, which would be the thighs and the upper arms. So how I elicit this story is I usually ask patients, do you have difficulty getting up from a chair? Do you have difficulty climbing upstairs? Do you have difficulty brushing your hair, you know, washing your hair in the shower? Because that's how you can tell if the upper arms and the thighs are having, you know, increased fatigue and weakness. And then very important is decreased bone density. Sometimes there's osteopenia or osteoporosis in younger women. And the reason might be there's excess cortisol. Um, the other things that endocrinologists are, of course, very interested in is the metabolic and systemic symptoms such as high blood pressure, high blood glucose, or diabetes. Um, and these can be manifested by increased thirst and urination. Cortisol also has significant effects on the brain. So you can have mood swings, depression, and anxiety. There are things called steroid neuroses and steroid psychoses. So there are men, uh, mental health effects that may be manifested when cortisol levels are high. Sometimes it's more subtle. Sometimes it's cognitive difficulties like memory or concentration issues. Then you can also have reproductive and sexual health issues. So in women, this might manifest as irregular or absent menstrual periods and hirsutism, which would be hair growth other than on your head. So usually, you know, face, chin, chest, abdomen, um, the darker hairs that women will notice. And men can have decreased libido and erectile dysfunction. And then you have some other symptoms that may occur, such as sleep disturbances, headaches. And in children, you can have stunting of growth, or decreased growth. So the reality is that the symptoms of Cushing's and Cushing syndrome is really that of a chameleon. You can have symptoms manifesting in different ways from one woman to the next, in one person to the next. Some may have the classic features that we see, you know, you know, publicized on in the media, like the rounded face and the weight gain. And some may have more subtle symptoms. But the, the cortisol is an important hormone. It affects so many, you know, um, systems and processes in the body. So the symptomatology can vary. We'll be back after a quick break. Hey, quick question for you. Are you someone who wants to be fit, healthy, and happy? And what if I told you you could get your dream body by simply just listening to a podcast? I'm Josh. And I'm KG. And we are the hosts of the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast. Listen, we get it. Fitness isn't easy. Carbs, no carbs. Just stop, okay? It doesn't have to be that complicated. And that's why we made this podcast. We get straight to the facts so you can become your best you. So the way to check us out is click the link in the show notes or go search Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast on any of the major podcast platforms. We'll see you soon. And the reverse kind of of Cushing's with no cortisol, which is also deadly if it not treated as Addison's disease, which President JFK had. That is correct. And that is, you know, what I like to call the opposite of Cushing's. It, instead of having an excess amount of cortisol being produced by the adrenal gland, the adrenal glands may become destroyed by an autoimmune process and stop producing cortisol. So the symptoms are opposite that. You might have weight gain, sorry, weight loss, soul cravings, low blood pressure. So almost an you know opposite from Cushing's, we have Addison's disease or you know, cortisol deficiency. So you are listening to the Speaking of Women's Health podcast, and I'm your host. Dr. Holly Thacker, and I'm interviewing a neuroendocrinologist at the Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Divya Yogi Morin, and we are talking all things Cushing's and cortisol. And we're going to move now into some of the treatment that might be available, both endogenous and exogenous. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think it's very important that we differentiate between what is endogenous Cushing's. The word endogenous means coming from within and what is exogenous Cushing's, which means coming from outside and the difference between the two. So endogenous Cushing's is Cushing syndrome that is caused by excess cortisol production that's coming from within the body either due to a tumor of the pituitary gland, which is then stimulating the adrenal gland to make excess cortisol, or from a tumor that is within the adrenal gland or a tumor from another site that can cause excess production of ACTH, which then stimulates the excess cortisol production. So that's endogenous Cushing, a tumor coming from within the body. Exogenous Cushing is caused by taking glucocorticoid medications, commonly referred to as just plain old steroids. And this is very, very prevalent. Um, you can go to, the, to any pharmacy and buy some hydrocortisone. You may be prescribed a medrol dose pack or prednisone for skin. I myself have had that done to me within the past month. Steroids are used to treat a variety of conditions, skin conditions, inflammatory bowel conditions, so many inflammatory conditions in the body, and they're good for treatment but and in the short term. But if you've been on them for a prolonged period of time, you may have something called exogenous Cushing syndrome, which is caused by these extra steroids that your body has been exposed to, and you'll have the same symptoms as, um, as Cushing syndrome that we discussed just now. So the treatment of exogenous Cushing's is to slowly, under physician guidance, reduce your doses of steroids and get you off of that as safely as possible. And I, I really want to you know, make this differentiation because what one of the concerning phrases I heard in the media this past two months is that you, have, you can have the type of Cushing's that just goes away on its own. And that may be true if it was caused by you taking steroids or something else. But if you have endogenous Cushing's, then it's being caused by a tumor within your body, and that is not going to go away on its own. And that has to be treated. So endogenous Cushing's, the goal of treatment is always to bring the cortisol levels into the normal healthy range. And for most cases of endogenous Cushing's, the definitive treatment is surgery. Surgery directed at a pituitary tumor or the, an adrenal tumor, sometimes we have ectopic Cushing's. The word ectopic means that it's coming from an area that is not where it usually comes from. So not from the adrenal or the pituitary. The most common causes of ectopic Cushing's is from tumors in the lung, sometimes in the thymus and other areas. But the primary treatment would be surgical removal of the source of the excess ACTH or cortisol. Now, sometimes people cannot have surgery for a variety of reasons. When surgery isn't an option or it has not been completely curative, meaning you had surgery and there's still some residual left, that's when we can come in with medications or radiation. And that is my role in the pituitary clinic. We have excellent neurosurgeons that are highly specialized in pituitary surgery that can remove the tumors, but my job is to use medications if needed. And we have medications that act directly at the pituitary tumor, and we have other medications that act at the adrenal glands and stop cortisol production. So, and also we, if we don't radiation, if surgery is not an option or medications don't work, radiation may be an option. And then in certain cases that are recurrent or refractory and unresponsive to surgery, radiation, or medications, then the adrenal glands, which are the factory that produces cortisol, may need to be removed as a last resort and you know, definitive treatment. And if that happens, then you'll need cortisol replacement because the adrenal glands have been removed. So as you can see, there, are, there is a variety of treatment options that are available. So this treatment process is a very personalized process that also involves managing the associated comorbidities like weight gain, high blood pressure, osteoporosis, diabetes, psychiatric symptoms, and reproductive symptoms that might occur with Cushing's. 
You know, I think that I've over the years had a lot of women come to see me who think that they have Cushing's mm -hmm. because they have weight gain in the belly. They have mood symptoms. Their skin is thinner. They're slower to heal from infections. They have that stria gravidarium, whether they had children or not, yes. those big purple stretch marks. And with weight gain comes elevated blood pressure and musculoskeletal symptoms. That is correct. But most of the time, it's not Cushing's disease or Cushing's syndrome. Can you tell us how you get at that overlap? Yes, absolutely. So there are a couple other conditions that can cause elevated cortisol. And some of these are, you know, being overweight, um, having diabetes, having insulin resistance, having polycystic ovarian syndrome. These are, you know, area, these are conditions that can cause elevation of cortisol, but not Cushing syndrome. So a lot of these symptoms, there's overlap most of these symptoms have some element of weight gain to them. Um, but there's, it's really important to differentiate between what we call non-neoplastic Cushing's caused by some of these other benign conditions like the diabetes, insulin resistance, you know, weight gain, PCOS. That's a, a, those are benign conditions. And we need to differentiate those from Cushing syndrome, Cushing disease caused by a pituitary tumor or an adrenal tumor. So this is where the diagnosis is very important. So there are a variety of tests done to diagnose Cushing disease. And in the conditions we mentioned before, those, a lot of this was formerly called pseudo-Cushing. Now we call it um, non-neoplastic Cushing. You won't find the full you know, um, clinical presentation that we see in Cushing syndrome. So you might, you might find one or two of the clinical features, but not all. And then when you do the biochemical testing, um, you, you'll only have one out of the three tests being positive instead of the two out of the three tests that are needed. So let's talk about those you know, three tests that we have to do. Um, we have to do three tests to diagnose someone with high cortisol or Cushing's. Diagnosing Cushing's is a long process. Sometimes, you know, it can take a long time. And this diagnostic journey for Cushing syndrome might often commence with your primary care physician starting to order one or two tests. And then when it's abnormal, referring you to an endocrinologist for specialized testing. So let's talk about these three tests. The first test is late night saliva cortisols. So there is a specific pattern, we call this a circadian pattern of cortisol secretion that is present in all human beings, if you have a normal sleep-wake cycle, where cortisol levels peak in the morning when you wake up, they go down throughout the day, and they're at its lowest at midnight. So one principle in endocrinology is that when you suspect that something is high, you want to check it when it's supposed to be low. So what we do is we check midnight or bedtime saliva samples. We send our patients home with three saliva tubes. Um, it used to be two, but I find when you send someone home with two saliva tubes, you're going to get one positive and one high, one, sorry, one negative and one positive, and you don't know what to do with that. When you send someone home with three tests, chances are you'll get at least two telling you the same thing. And you need two out of those three saliva tests to be high, and that's the saliva test. Then your second test is going to be what we call a blood test, but it's called a low-dose dexamethasone suppression test, where you take a dexamethasone pill at midnight, and then we get labs done the next morning, and your cortisol and ACTH levels are supposed to go down if you do not have Cushing's, and if you have Cushing's, they'll remain high. And then the third test is a 24-hour urine cortisol collection. So we have saliva, we have blood tests, and we have 24-hour urine, and you need two out of those three tests to be concurrent, saying the same thing, in order for us to either rule in or rule out Cushing syndrome. Now, once you've done those three tests and you've gotten your diagnosis, Cushing syndrome, that does not tell us where it's coming from. It just tells us that you have high cortisol, but you will need further testing to determine whether it's coming from the adrenal gland or the pituitary gland. 
And getting that right diagnosis usually means some more imaging scan and sometimes specialized testing where we actually sample blood from a vein near your pituitary gland to see if it's coming from the pituitary gland or somewhere else in your body. So I always tell my patients, this is a marathon. This is not going to be a sprint, right? So we need to like buckle in and get ready to get the correct diagnosis. We do have to do some extensive testing. This diagnostic process can be complex, require multiple tests and specialist consultations. But when we get that diagnosis, we can treat appropriately and avoid the long, long-term complications like high blood pressure, bone loss, and diabetes that is associated with Cushing's. You know, you mentioned the salivary hormones, and um, in my field in menopausal medicine, there are a lot of people who don't understand the sex hormones and are um, charging women a lot of money to do the so-called Dutch test and salivary hormones and Mm -hmm. uh, prescribing unregulated compounded hormones, which we've had podcasts on. Um, You can listen Mm -hmm. uh, to some of our other podcasts for those interested in that and injecting pellets under the skin, giving very high levels in tachyphylaxis. And what I always tell women is that salivary test for cortisol is validated, but not for the sex hormones. And I just wondered if you had any other further comments on that. Yeah, absolutely. I often see that a similar situation where, you know, I'm sent maybe 20, 30 cortisol saliva tubes done at various times of the day. But the only thing that's validated for diagnosing high cortisol um, in multiple studies is the we late night. So you, at bedtime, it used to be midnight, but we realize that everybody's cycle is different. So we can't tell everyone to get your tests done at midnight. We want you to check your saliva cortisol as what at what is naturally your bedtime. And that is validated for diagnosing um, high cortisol levels. Now, I often run into problems and with people are there who are ways working for- third shift, or, you know, multiple nights in a row. Are there ways um, that our listeners can keep their cortisol levels healthy and minimize their risk for Cushing's? I mean, do we know what the etiology that causes either the pituitary or the adrenal glands or some other ectopic tissue to go wild? That's a good, that's a great question. Um, With a lot of tumors, there are multiple factors, some of them genetic, some of them environmental, some of them, you know, we don't really know the multiple factors that get turned on for these tumors to be formed. So when there is, you know, a Cushing's pituitary tumor or adrenal tumor, there really isn't much that you can do apart from treating the cause of the, the source of the Cushing's by seeing your doctor and having that source dealt with. However, just overall, I'm seeing a lot of things on social media um, being recommended by some influencers, um, you know, basically talking about promoting supplements, doing certain workouts, you know, doing different things, you know, that can reduce cortisol levels. And it's important to like make that differentiation between regulating cortisol levels in someone who does not have Cushing disease and just wants to, you know, be calm and regulate cortisol levels. But those techniques will not work if you have a tumor that is having, producing what we call autonomous secretion of ACTH or cortisol. Autonomous means automatic. It has escaped from the normal feedback mechanisms that control production then these lifestyle modifications are not going to work on a Cushing's tumor. So that is one thing um, you know, to keep in mind. These lifestyle interventions, they're going to be ineffective in controlling excess cortisol production that is coming from a tumor. Now, that being said, there are some things in people who do not have Cushing's but just want to be healthy and want to have good cortisol levels that can be done. And there, some of that information is available online, some of that I have contributed to, and I can share some of the tips that are supported by at least some data and some literature. Um, one of those is getting enough sleep. So we know that you know prioritizing sleep helps to reduce cortisol levels. People who have chronic sleep issues such as obstructive sleep apnea, 
insomnia and shift workers, these conditions are associated with higher cortisol levels. Not Cushing syndrome or Cushing disease, but just higher cortisol levels. Now, exercising regularly can also decrease cortisol depending on the intensity of exercise. So moderate exercise such as walking, cycling, swimming, and some resistant um, some resistance training can decrease cortisol levels in the body. You know, eating a healthy diet that's rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grain, lean protein can also help control cortisol levels. There are different foods that cause different people to have inflammatory reactions. Some of it may be associated with our food system, uh, how much processed foods we eat now, all the different additives, you know, preservatives and things that are so prevalent in our diets now that might cause some any inf- inflammatory condition. So anything that causes inflammation can raise your cortisol. So controlling that in ways that we can can help control cortisol. And then being hydrated and also practicing mindfulness. There are some studies that talk about mindfulness, meditation, Tai Chi, these deep breathing exercises that are natural stress relievers that can help reduce cortisol levels in the body. Because remember, cortisol is a stress hormone. So if you can do things to manage your stress, then you would be able to control your cortisol levels and live a healthy life. But this is in people who do not have Cushing's disease or a tumor. And all of those topics from sleep to healthy nutrition, to relaxation, to exercise, we have a wealth of that information on our speakingofwomenshealth.com site, all of our social media sites. If you don't already follow us on Facebook or X or Pinterest or LinkedIn, Telegram, Rumble, YouTube, we're on all of those social media channels trying to support people because it is a a very stressful time. I just have a couple of pituitary questions um, outside of Cushing's, but since I order uh, pituitary hormones almost every day in the form of follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, uh, which just is a very short snapshot in time for perimenopause, um, and I know a lot of physicians don't order it because they say, oh, it changes and, you know, what difference does it make? But it it does help me because some women have prolonged perimenopause. And I've had a couple of interesting um, patients recently where they un- where they underwent um, complete hysterectomy and removal of both their ovaries. And I always teach my fellows, get the op report, read the surgical report. You can't just go on what the person thinks they had surgically removed. That's always very important. And I just always emphasize to my patients, if you have surgery and something's taken out of your body, whether it's your brain or your pelvis or any part of your body, you really should keep hard copy reports um, because that's very important and memories, you know, fade. And if you have unusual workup for unusual conditions with, you know, expensive tests, it's really good to keep those results. But I had a patient whose FSH post-op was normal and she continued to have pain and her estrogen level was higher than I thought it would be based on the hormone estrogen replacement I was giving her. And come to find out, she indeed had a remnant ovary and had to go in and have that ovary removed, the remnant tissue, even though she clearly had both ovaries. And so we classically teach in the menopause field that once there's no more eggs, um, or if the ovaries are removed or ablated because of chemo or radiation, that even if you give adequate amounts of estrogen, you don't drive that FSH back to normal because of inhibin A and B produced in the ovaries, which give a feedback to FSH. But I have seen a couple of conditions lately where the woman is clearly um, postmenopausal, has had oophorectomy, her anti-mullerian hormone is extremely low, consistent with the menopausal range. And there's not the suspicion for a remnant ovary uh, with anything else. And I've seen a couple sporadic case reports showing that the FSH can come back down over time. So I just wondered, do you think that's some pituitary fatigue or do you think it's just a manifestation that the person is just medically ill and they're getting some degree of uh, hypopituitary, you know, hypo gonadism, even though they already have primary hypogonadism. Um, I just wondered, or 
if, if you had any comments about that, or is there anything else that would block inhibit A and B and falsely make us think that um, there's something maybe going on in the pituitary uh, or the hypothalamus yeah. that's not? So there is a natural aging and slowing down that goes on in the pituitary gland. Um, and I suspect that might be contributing to some of these sort of lab results that you see where, you know, there is a, less than what is expected. There is, you know, a lower FSH level coming down. Um, I think that communication between, you know, inhibin A and B and, you know, what's happening in the pituitary really hasn't been studied in postmenopausal women because probably there wasn't much to study. Uh, so I don't have a, a clear answer for, for that, um, but it's possible that there is some aging and slowing down that occurs um, in the gonadotropes within the pituitary gland that might be contributing there. Mm -hmm. So you think that would be at a pituitary level as opposed to a hypothalamic level? Yeah, it's it's uh, probably at the pituitary level. Um, it's a, hard, a little bit harder for us to you know make that connection with the hypothalamus because we don't usually check, um, you know, things like gonadotropin releasing hormone in our mm -hmm. regular panels, like you know, like you've kind of alluded to before. Um, yeah. And um, certainly, you know, we see women who are sent to us for menopause. Uh, but their FSH levels are normal and their estrogen levels are very low. And we just think that it's not a primary ovarian problem, that it's something at the pituitary level, potentially from medical stress, uh, a lot of eating disorders we certainly see, um, and other other medical illnesses. And sometimes it's hard to exactly categorize some of these patients. I give them estrogen replacement, of course, just for their bones and for anti-aging purposes. So in that situation, I've actually stumbled across a few pituitary tumors inadvertently in you know what I consider to be an early menopause age group, right? In the 50s and 60s, where I, I feel like the FSH should be much higher than this, but it's normal or what we like to call in, in an endocrinology, it's inappropriately normal. And then, you know, when I see a low FSH, a lower than I would expect in someone who is clearly postmenopausal. I sometimes check the entire pituitary hormone and I have stumbled across um, tumors this way where the FSH is low, one or two other hormones are abnormal. I've gone on to do imaging and I've found a pituitary tumor. So I think that occurs when I see that in women who are in their 50s and 60s, you know, early menopause, then that definitely, you know, triggers me to do further pituitary evaluation. I think when we go beyond that, I wonder about, you know, some pituitary aging and pituitary fatigue kicking in. Mm -hmm. And, and be, in besides checking prolactin, um, are there any other tip-offs, you know, besides visual field changes or anything else that would make you do a more expensive panel? Yeah, you know, when I find that there's one pituitary um, hormone that is deficient, I usually get the full panel. Uh, I think some of my experience has now colored my practice where, you know, we've stumbled across things after just noticing that one pituitary hormone was normal. So it was abnormal. So I would usually order a full pituitary panel um, to begin with. Of course, if there is a woman who's having regular menstrual periods, I don't do the FSH LH estradiol evaluation. So that leaves me with just four pituitary hormones to check. Um, and then if I find that two or more of these hormones are abnormal, then a lot of times I would proceed to getting pituitary MRI or imaging. Mm -hmm. And uh, speaking of other pituitary uh, tumors, any, any comments on um, acromegaly? I, I certainly have... I think had more acromegalic patients in my practice than Cushing's. Yeah, so that's that's interesting because acromegaly is is rare, um, and the symptoms aren't as are, are really subtle. I find that mm -hmm. people who suffer or live with Cushing's, these symptoms are are so debilitating or have affected their lives or been pointed out to them by other people that they really come to the office looking for help. Acromegaly tends to be a little bit more subtle, and unfortunately, that means that a lot of times it has gone on for many years before someone gets into the office with the typical symptoms of, 
you know, increased size of the hands, the feet, um, you know, hat size or head size, or changes in their facial features. So it's a little bit more subtle, but if you are if you are noticing it, then it means that a lot of times it's been present for you know five to ten years. I had a very interesting case recently where I saw a, a woman in her mid thirties, well now late thirties, I believe she was thirty seven, who had gone through three pregnancies, and she just attributed her her symptoms to getting older and having babies. And when I questioned her, she had some very very classic acromegaly features. She had bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome. Her, sh- her feet had increased in size, two sizes um, over the course of three pregnancies. Um, you know, she had that, you know, very warm, doughy handshake that we, you know, we call the characteristic acromegaly handshake. And I think what struck me about that case is how often women, they either they just, you know, push aside their symptoms or they attribute it to pregnancies or just going through life and they don't, you know, come in telling us about it. And this and she had a real acromegaly tumor. So, you know, I think a lot of women come in and tell me that, you know, they told their doctor that their feet had increased in size and they were brushed off and they were told that, yeah, that <laughs> happens. You've had so many pregnancies, but an increase in foot size it is an objective examination finding that, you know, mm-hmm. led, led us to diagnose this poor woman with acromegaly. She had surgery last month. I've seen her since then. She feels fantastic. She has lost a weight because acromegaly, there's a lot of soft tissue retention of fluid. And I, it just, I mm-hmm. think that that really hit me hard, how much women just kind of brush off their symptoms. And unfortunately, many times providers also brush off, you know, symptoms. Uh, I think, a lot of us have had increase in foot size, but yeah. yeah, I would say like a half a size. I had three children and maybe just only, you know, by a half size of a shoe size and, and maybe just a little bit broader back right. and rib cage. So you do expect some body changes, <laughs> but two sizes is huge. Sure. <laughs> It's yeah. huge. And I, I couldn't wish- believe that this poor woman had lived with that, lived with bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome, had spacing in between her teeth, had to get Invisalign, and no one had thought, hmm, maybe we should test her for acromegaly. <laughs> yes, yeah. I guess some of these rare diseases, but it does drive home the message to women and to any clinicians, doctors, nurse practitioners, anyone in the health arena that listens to our podcast, you know, when patients come in with specific symptoms, even if it doesn't ring a bell or seem common, you really do have to listen to that person because they may have a rare condition right. that's very treatable, whether it's Cushing's or acromegaly right. or uh, amyloidosis, a lot, of, a lot of different things. And even though most of our patients who are tired aren't getting enough sleep and most of our patients who are overweight, are, are not eating the right food, not doing intermittent fasting, not building enough muscle with exercise. Right. There certainly are real um, medical conditions that do need to be uh, evaluated and treated. Yeah. And Dr. Yogi Morin, is there anything yeah. else that you'd like to share with our audience before we wrap up this session in the Sunflower House? Yeah, I I think I'd probably want to end with a word of caution about self-diagnosis and getting information overload from the internet. I think, you know, um, it's it's very important that when you get your information, and there's a lot of information online, not all of it is accurate. Um, You want to check the credentials of those that are writing these things and who give you advice and just make sure that they have legitimate expertise in the area that you're interested in. I mean, I am certainly grateful that patients read things online and then come to us for help. You know, there are several studies that uh, that suggest that as many as over 80 percent of adults in the United States, they search the Internet whenever they have concerns about their health. And it's if something is difficult and almost impossible for even a skilled, skilled clinician to diagnose, then, you know, the internet really shouldn't be your physician. And, um, you know, always make sure that you talk to your doctor about your symptoms and that you get proper testing and good care. And you're seeing a physician who listens to you, takes your symptoms seriously, you know, and does the appropriate evaluation. 
And, you know, we're here to help. And I'm really grateful for you all having me on your podcast today to talk about this really rare but very important condition. Um, and I hope the information that I shared today was helpful and that you guys were enlightened by this. Well, thank you so much. And Dr. Yogi Morin sees patients in the endocrinology department at the Cleveland Clinic main campus. And you can call 216 216- three five eight zero three six six if you'd like to make an appointment with her and I hope to have Dr. Yogi Morin back in a future interview to talk about her personal experience and in gestational diabetes and we have a lot of good information you know November is diabetes awareness month and it's becoming such an epidemic um around the world and certainly in the United States. So I hope that you tune in to that future podcast. And I want to thank our listeners for uh, joining us. And we're so grateful for your support and hope that you'll share our podcast. You can uh, leave us a five-star rating. Um, You can also go on speakingofwomenshealth.com and leave a donation to our nonprofit. And to catch all the latest from us, subscribe or follow for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn, anywhere you go to listen to podcasts. And if you've got a question for us, visit speakingofwomenshealth.com and fill out the contact us form. And we just might talk about your topic or answer your question on an upcoming episode. Thanks again for listening and we will see you next time in the Sunflower House.